Please stand with me and hear our call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let us go to him in prayer. Our great God and Father, we do come before you this morning grateful and thankful that we can gather to worship you, to worship you for simply who you are, our creator, the creator of all things, and for what you have done, and not letting us remain in a fallen state, but sending your son to redeem your people. Cast the world from our thoughts. Cast the concerns of this world from our thoughts, Lord, and help us to simply focus upon you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 735 for the glory of Patri. Turn with me in your Psalter to Psalm 104a and let us praise him by singing, My soul bless the Lord, Psalm 104a.
turn to the reading of the law of God from Ephesians chapter 5, this Lord's Day. Ephesians chapter 5, the law given so the sinner might know their need of a Savior so that we might know how to walk before our God. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, let us pay heed to his word. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not associate with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Thus for the reading, please be seated. We will take time for private confession of sin. I will finish with a corporate confession. Let us pray. great God and Father, we do come before you to confess that we do not live lives filled with thankfulness, but that we continue to desire more than what you have wisely determined for us to have. We come continuing to deal with covetousness and impurity, things which are out of place, filthiness, foolish talk, coarse joking. Help us, Lord, to not be deceived with the empty words of the world or even immature Christians. Help us to be focused upon you. Forgive us for taking our eyes off of you and placing them on the things of the world. Forgive us for the sins we have confessed here this morning. The ones you continue to open up to us even now. Help us to remember and to walk as children of light. For that is what is pleasing to you. You are our God. Help us to live accordingly. And we thank you again and praise you because we know, Lord, that in you, you continue to work in us, to sanctify us, Help us to receive this sanctification. Help us to see it. Help us to grow in knowledge and understanding and love of what you are doing for us. Help us in all of this, we pray. 
In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> and for those that have repented and believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, I offer you this assurance of pardon of your sin when we read, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Amen and amen. Take your Trinity hymnal, turn with me, if you will, to hymn 461. And let us thank him by singing, not what my hands have done. 461. Stand with me if you are able. We will turn to the reading of God's Word beginning in Joshua. Joshua chapter 13. Let us pay heed to this inerrant and fallible holy word of our God. <clears throat> now Joshua was old and advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old and advanced in years, and there remains yet very much land to possess. This is the land that yet remains, all the regions of the Philistines and all those of the Geshurites from the Shihor, which is east of Egypt, northward to the boundary of Ekron. It is counted as, it is counted as Canaanite. There are five rulers of the Philistines, those of Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron, and those of the Avim in the south, all the land of the Canaanites, and Mirah that belongs to the Sidonians, to Aphek, to the boundary of the Amorites, and the land of the Gebelites, and all Lebanon toward the sunrise from Baal God, below Mount Hermon to Lebo Hamath, 
all the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon to Mis Misrafoth, Maim, even all the Sidonians. I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel. Only allot the land to Israel for an inheritance as I have commanded you. Now therefore divide this land for an inheritance to the nine tribes and half the tribe of Manasseh. With the other half of the tribe of Manasseh, the Reubenites and the Gadites received their inheritance, which Moses gave them beyond the Jordan eastward, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them from Aroer, which is on the edge of the valley of the Arnon, and the city that is in the middle of the valley, and all the tableland of Mediba as far as Debon, and all the cities of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon as far as the boundary of the Ammonites, and Gilead in the region of the Geshurites and, Ma and Akathites and all Mount Hermon and all Bashan to Salakah, all the kingdom of Og and Bashan who reigned in Ashtaroth and in Edrei, he alone was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. These Moses had struck and driven out, yet the people of Israel did not drive out the Geshurites or the Maakathites, Ma but Geshur and Maakath dwell in the midst of Israel to this day. To the tribe of Levi alone, Moses gave no inheritance. The offerings by fire to the Lord God of Israel are their inheritance, as he said to him. And Moses gave an inheritance to the tribe of the people of Reuben according to their clans. So their territory was from Aroer, which is on the edge of the valley of the Arnon, and the city that is in the middle of the valley, and all the tableland by Medeba, with Heshbon and all its cities that are in the tableland, Debon and Bamoth Baal and Beth Baal Meon and Jahaz and Kedemoth and Mephaath and Kiriathaim and Sibma and Zareth Shahar on the hill of the valley and Beth Peor and the slopes of Pisgah and Beth Jeshemoth, that is, all the cities of the tableland and all the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, whom Moses defeated with the leaders of Midian. Evi and Rechem and Zerah and Hur and Reba, the princes of Sihon who lived in the land. Balaam, also the son of Beor, the one who practiced divination, was killed with the sword by the people of Israel among the rest of their slain. And the border of the people of Reuben was the Jordan as a boundary. This was the inheritance of the people of Reuben according to their clans with their cities and villages. Moses gave an inheritance also to the tribe of Gad, to the people of Gad according to their clans. Their territory was Jazer and all the cities of Gilead and half the land of the Ammonites to Aroer, which is east of Rabbah, and from Heshbon to Ramoth Mizpeh and Betonim, and from Mahanaim to the territory of Debir, and in the valley of Beth Haram, Beth Nimrah, Sakoth, and Zaphon, the rest of the kingdom of Sihon, king of Heshbon, having the Jordan as a boundary to the lower end of the Sea of Kinnereth, eastward beyond the Jordan. This is the inheritance of the people of Gad according to their clans with their cities and villages. And Moses gave an inheritance to the half-tribe of Manasseh. It was allotted to the half-tribe of the people of Manasseh according to their clans. Their region extended from Mahanaim through all Bashan, the whole kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, and all the towns of Jair, which are in Bashan, 60 cities, and half Gilead and Ashtaroth and Edri, the cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan, these were allotted to the people of Machir, the son of Manasseh, for the half of the people of Machir, according to their clans. These are the inheritances that Moses distributed in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan east of Jericho. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel is, is their inheritance, just as he said to them. Thus for Joshua 13. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, again, let us pay heed to this word of our God. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and then a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. 
But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen uh, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people, and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Thus for the reading from the book of Acts. Take your Trinity hymnal with me, if you would. Turn to page 845. We have heard the word of the Lord. Let us confess together to him with the saints of old what we believe. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Lord, your word tells us, praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. You wrap yourself in light as with a garment. You stretch out the heavens like a tent. You lay the beams of your upper chambers on their waters. You make the clouds your chariot and ride on the wings of the wind. You make winds your messengers, flames of fire your servants, You set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains, but at your rebuke, the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You also tell us from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him 
and His righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep His covenant and remember to obey His precepts. The Lord has established His throne in heaven and His kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you His angels, you mighty ones who do His bidding, who obey His word. Praise the Lord, all His heavenly hosts, you His servants who do His will. Praise the Lord, all His works everywhere in His dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Lord, thank You for today that we can meet together corporately and worship You. We thank You that as we gather, that You give us Your Spirit of truth. We thank You for Your Word, Lord, which we can read and pray over, listen to, be preached to from. Lord, we know it's the word of truth. It's the bread of life. Help us to treasure this more than the things of earth. We thank You for this day that is set apart, Lord, to worship You. It is rest, but it is worship. You are worthy of worship. We thank You for Your holiness, for Your grace in our lives. We thank You for this church, which is Your people. Lord, ground in us the spirit of unity that we'd have an unbreakable fellowship grounded in truth. Give us perseverance that none would wander from the faith. That we would have Your joy that would be full, sustained, and looking always to You. That You would give us Your protection from the world, from the flesh, from the devil. Lord, continue your work in sanctification. Set us apart in holiness. Conform us to Christ. That we would bear witness to you, to your glory by the gospel of Christ. Lord, ground in us the principles of your word by the true spirit of Christ's gospel because we are your servants. Lord, make us faithful people. Bring us faithful people to disciple. We lift up today the bride of Christ, the worldwide church, your kingdom. Lord, build her up, meet her needs for ministries around the world that you would raise up faithful pastors to preach your word in truth and with power, the unction of the Spirit. Lord, we pray for church leaders here, for Pastor Todd, for the elders, that you give us wisdom and strength and protection. For Pastor and Marlena and the family, that you would give them a hedge of protection, meet all their needs, heal what needs to be healed, give them providence by your hand. Lord, protect them from harm. For elders, for the deacons, Lord, give us wisdom to make right and wise decisions. We pray for Kay and Marilyn, Lord, we lift them up before you today that you would encourage them, meet their needs. Fill our minds, Lord, with the knowledge of heavenly doctrines. Help us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, Lord, as You encourage us. We lift up all the families and parents that You would give parents and families wisdom and grace to be obedient to Your Word. Husbands and wives, that You would bless marriages, bless relationships, to honor and respect, love each other, for the youth, for children, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pray for our prodigal children, Lord, that You would turn their hearts to You. For prodigal members, Lord, and people that have been here at church, that You would turn their hearts to You. Lord, we pray for Melvin and Bonnie, George and Elsie, for Ava, Tom and Pat, Lord, we thank you for these dear people. We ask that you would meet their needs. Lord, we thank you for blessing Tom to be healthy enough to be back with us to worship you. Lord, glorify yourself in him and Pat's lives. That you would be with them as they go through doctor's appointments this next week. Accomplish your will in their lives. We lift up Grady, Dustin, Debbie and Clyde and Hector, Lord, we ask that you would meet needs of each of these people. For Clinton and Lacey, Lord, you would bless them as a family. 
that you would be with Lacey and the new little one with health, with provision, with protection. Father, give them wisdom as they walk each day with you. Chad and Stacy and their family, Ben and Shirley. Lord, we ask for Debbie, Stephan, and Kelsey, that, Lord, you would bless these people, their marriages, their families, that they would walk rightly before you in humbleness. Lord, for the single people, that you would meet their needs. Help us each, Lord, to trust you and to seek you above the things of the world. We thank you for the ministry in this church. Lord, for the music ministry, for the ladies that prepare and play. Thank you for Sunday school teachers. Lord, for the upcoming lessons to come and the classes in the fall that you would meet needs of teachers and students. We lift up visitors, those who cannot be with us today, to encourage for our nation. Lord, we live in a land of sin. Lord, be with our president, our vice president, families, counselors, congressmen. That you raise up righteous and godly leaders, that you would convict of sin where it needs to be, that you would work in their lives and through their decisions to help protect your church to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be faithful, to pray for those even we don't like. But Father, we are under their authority and it's an authority from you. Accomplish your will in them. Lord, we pray for the worship service to come, the message to come. Be with Chad, give him power and unction of the Holy Spirit for Ben this afternoon. That, Lord, your word would go out, that we would listen to the message, not the messenger, and that you would be glorified. Lord, you ask, we're asked by your disciples to teach them to pray. We pray together now our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. seated take your trinity hymnal turn to 625 we will prepare for this message by singing tell me the old old story 625 
Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse 17 this morning as we read, and I will be exhorting from verses 18 of chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 5. So if you will, follow along with me as we read. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask now that you would help us to understand your word Lord, help me to speak the words that you would have your people to hear. And Lord, help us all to understand, believe, and act upon your word. For your glory, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we're going to look at this section of Scripture in four points. Our first point will be verses 18 and 19 of of chapter 1. God's wisdom is the power of salvation. Point two will be God's wisdom defeats the world in verses 20 through 25. Point three is God displays his wisdom through the weak in verses 26 through 31. And point four is God displays his wisdom in weak ministers in verses one through five of chapter two. So first we look at God's wisdom is the power of salvation in verses 18 through 19. Again, verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The first word in our section of Scripture this morning begins with the conjunction for, which tells us that this statement is connected to the previous verse as part of a continuing argument. Verse 18 is building off of verse 17. Our verse is showing why Paul did not come preaching the gospel in eloquent wisdom. Now, Paul is in no way disparaging the use of wisdom or wise words. After all, we understand that the gospel is true wisdom. Wisdom comes, true wisdom comes from God alone. And we know that in Christ and in the gospel. But it is important that we understand that the wisdom from God does not look like wisdom to the world. 
A great example of this is actually found in Acts chapter 24. And you can turn there if you wish. We'll read this quickly. Acts chapter 24. Beginning in verse... We won't read the whole thing. I would encourage you to go home tonight and read Tertullus's part of this uh, argument between him and Paul. But I'm going to skip directly to what Paul says, beginning in verse 10. Verse 10 of chapter 24. Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and make an accusation, should they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when they stood before the council, when I stood before the council. Other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. So Paul is standing before a tribunal, a council, where he could possibly be killed for what he's going to say. And the wisest thing that Paul can think to talk about is the resurrection of Jesus Christ before people that don't know Jesus, that don't believe in Jesus, that don't care about Jesus. That is wisdom. That is the wisdom that Paul had, and that is the wisdom that the church has, and that is the power that the congregation of God wields. He proclaimed this gospel, this wisdom, even in situations when pulling some of the words probably would have been wise for his own self-preservation. And that is why he doesn't pull those words. That is why it is important to him, as he says, for the word for him to preach and not empty the cross of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul is reminding the church at Corinth that he did not come as a lawyer. He did not come as somebody who came out of the schools of the philosophers with well-crafted and curated sermons meant to, to tickle the ears of people. He had come to Corinth with the power of God. It is the word of the cross that is the power of God to save. And this right here is quite a statement for Paul to make. See, we kind of gloss over the scandal of the crucifixion and the cross today because we're not exactly using that method of, of execution. But in the mind of a Roman citizen, in the mind of a Jew, in the mind of a, a Greek person in the day of Paul, this was a terrible, scandalous way to die. So we are tempted to ask, why is it so hard for anyone in that time period to believe that Jesus was the Christ? They, a lot of these people saw him crucified. Why is it so hard for them to believe that he is the Messiah? But to the original audience, the cross held a stigma that only Christ could overcome. It was the very worst punishment imaginable to the Greek. In fact, it was considered so shameful that it was rarely used on Roman citizens and instead was res res reserved for slaves, soldiers that deserted from war, and foreigners who had violated important laws such as starting wars or riots within Roman, Roman provinces. And to the Jew... Well, God told them, and we'll look more at this later when we get into, further into the text. But God told them that all who are hung on a tree are cursed, and that's in Deuteronomy. They're cut off from Israel. But Paul reminds the church that this is the power of God. But it can only be understood that way by those who are being saved. So to the first century church, as they read this 
they would understand that Paul is placing the present and future reality of the church and its success in the context of a shameful event called the crucifixion. If you are a real follower of Christ, it is only because you embrace Christ through his cross. And that can only happen by the power of God. Paul continues his argumentation. This power is consistent with the historical redemptive narrative of the entire Bible. Verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. This appears to be an allusion to Isaiah 29, verse 14. Because this people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is, command, is, is a commandment taught by men, therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Paul is citing a time in Israel's history when they were trusting in Egypt for salvation, for redemption from Assyria. Isaiah told the leaders and the people that to trust in anything but God's means of redemption was folly. Israel had two options. They could repent of their sins and, and return back to God and do what God told them to do. Or they could go into exile and there repent and turn back to God and be redeemed. That was their options. And what Israel does is they turn to Egypt. They turn to other means of salvation. The church at Corinth, due to their factions that we saw earlier, are guilty of the same sins against God. They are enamored with the abilities of man, often missing the reality that God is working in spite of men. They still act as if it is Apollos, or Paul that is important and necessary for redemption. In creating factions, the Corinthian church is putting their trust in men and not God. And Paul points out in quoting Isaiah that this will result in judgment. They are focused on the preacher and not the one the preacher is pointing to. Corinth thought that the power of God was in specific preachers. Paul here warns all Christians, the Corinthians included, that the power is in God and it comes from God. And that God will destroy anything and anyone who attempts to take his glory. Jesus tears down all idols, including preachers. And as Paul quotes this Old Testament text, he is making it clear that God will continue to tear down any wisdom that seeks to replace his power. Paul brings this Old Testament text into the current situation and examining the culture and those outside the church. And this is point two. God's wisdom defeats the world. Chapter 1, verses 20 through verse 25. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? This seems to be another Old Testament quotation from Isaiah 19, 11, and 12, and possibly Isaiah 38, verses 18 and 19. And I will read those for you as well. The princes of Zoan are utterly foolish. The wisest counselors of Pharaoh give stupid counsel. How can you say to Pharaoh, I am a son of the wise, a son of ancient kings? Where then are your wise men? Let them tell you that they might know what the Lord of hosts has purposed against Egypt. And then in verse, or chapter 33 of Isaiah, beginning in 18. Your heart will muse on the terror. Where is he who counted? Where is he who weighed the tribute? Where is he who continued, excuse me, counted the towers? You will see no more the insolent people, the people of an obscure speech that you cannot comprehend, stammering in a tongue that you cannot understand. In bringing up these Old Testament, Old Testament texts, Paul is asking a rhetorical question to the Corinthian church, to which the church would have to say they were all destroyed. Every attempt at stopping the plan of God or changing the plan of God to make it more convenient for people or to make it to seem easier for people to swallow in the time of Isaiah was destroyed, wiped away, obliterated. Every king, scribe, prophet, debater that tried to stop God's plans or change God's plan 
has been cast into destruction for all eternity. There was no hope in Israel apart from God's plan, God's wisdom, God's power. And Paul asks a fourth question here, which ties the Old Testament that we just read in with the Corinth situation. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? The Corinthian and us needs to think about this. God's pattern of destroying the wisdom of the world continues. The the Corinthians had a long history of worldly religions. They had a pantheon of false gods that they worshipped. And none of those false gods actually brought reconciliation to man with God. They had all the famous philosophers, and none of them brought reconciliation between man and God. But since the word of the gospel has entered their culture, has entered into their hearts, it has reconciled them to God. God has proven Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and Zeus and all these false ideas and beliefs to be foolish, to be nothing. He has beaten all of that pantheon of false gods and even what the Jews were now propping up as a false god of the Old Testament in rejecting Jesus. Paul points out that this was actually the point of how God accomplishes His salvation. In verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The wisdom that the world had never brought a saving relationship with God. God intended and succeeded in His plan of redemption that showcases that His wisdom is not like the world's wisdom. His wisdom shows how the world cannot know Him apart from His condescension. And His gospel shows itself unique because it does save those who believe. For the believer, they look at the gospel and are confident, not in themselves, but in God. But the reality of of God's plan is realized in the world where people have other opinions about what God ought to do and what salvation ought to look like. Verse 22, For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. The Jews want signs to prove that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And this is seen all throughout Jesus' earthly ministry. While He is performing signs, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are coming up to Him and asking for specific, particular signs from Him, despite the fact that His whole earthly ministry was chock full of signs and miracles. In chapter 6 of John, right after Jesus has fed the multitudes with the fish and the bread that He miraculously created out of nothing, the Pharisees come up and ask Him about the manna from heaven and how Moses had given it to them. And they're asking for, well, if you would give us this, we would believe in you. The problem for the Jews that asked for these signs is that they were demanding a standard of signs that fit with their misunderstanding of who this Messiah would be and what He would do. See, they thought that the Messiah was going to come down from heaven and He was going to make the Roman Empire fall apart and He was going to establish a kingdom on earth and He was going to rule and reign from His throne forever like that. And that they were never going to have to change. They were never going to have to do anything except for be a part of this glorious kingdom. And that's just not what the Messiah was ever intended to be. And that's not who Jesus is. And that's not what His signs pointed to. The Greeks seek after wisdom. Not the wisdom that we find in the book of Proverbs or in Jesus' life or in the New Testament anywhere. They were seeking after the type of wisdom that they would have found at the Areopagus in chapter 17 of Acts when, when Paul is interacting with them. They wanted the next Plato or the next Socrates. They wanted just a little bit more information. And we see this today, don't we? We just need a little bit more information about the human body, about, the, about, where, about where we came from evolution-wise, and we can just figure everything out. We just need a little bit more. And that's what the Greeks were seeking after, just a little more wisdom to make life ideal, to make things right. And in both cases, 
This makes sense for those who do not actually want God. Both groups are really part of the same group with different desires, with different interests. And in every age, this group of unbelievers is the pool from which God chooses to draw His people from. And God's not going to give the world what it wants. 23. But we preach Christ crucified. The way to true salvation, the way to to right living, the the way that the, the Greeks wanted to live, the good life, the way to eternal life, is through one man, Jesus Christ. We, we often pass over this title, Christ, as if it's simply a last name. But the word Christ is loaded with meaning for us. It was the title that was given to the Redeemer of Israel that was promised in the Old Testament. The one that would draw, as God promised, the whole world to Himself and make them to worship Him. Christ means anointed one in the Greek. And it was pictured in the Old Testament through prophets, priests, and kings. The Christ is the one who unites all three of those offices. He rules as king. He proclaims the word of God as the perfect prophet. And he applies the final and lasting sacrifice to his people for salvation. And he does this with a crucifixion. And this crucifixion has impact on all of its hearers. A stumbling block to Jews and its folly to Gentiles. Again, the concept that the Savior of the world would be crucified does affect all who hear it. For the Jew, it flies in the face of what they think their Messiah should do. And this goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree... His body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defy your land that, that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Since God allowed Jesus to be crucified, he must have been a criminal, a cursed criminal in the eyes of the Jew. He could not have been the Messiah. His death bears testimony to that reality in their minds. Jesus was not the Messiah because the Messiah would again come and conquer through military conquest. He was not going to die as a cursed man. But that is what Jesus did. And in doing that, it was was a mockery to the Jews of the day and what they wanted in their Messiah. It wasn't a, a dignified way for the Messiah to come and conquer. It wasn't a, a way that you could look up to and, and showcase to the rest of the world. Look at, look at our king. Our, he died on a tree. It doesn't really seem to fit, does it? And for the Greek, it was, it was foolish. How could a man from backwater Bethlehem who died be a savior to anyone? How could a man whose wisdom got him killed possibly offer real wisdom to the sophisticated Greek. How could a man from one of the most despised nations within the empire possibly offer anything of value to the top of society? The answer to both these people who are lost is he can't. He can't offer them anything that they want. So to the Jew and the Greek, the gospel is foolish. So why lead with that gospel? Why carry this banner into unknown territories and preach this Christ, this crucified Messiah? If you know it's offensive, if you know that people think it's foolish, why do that, Paul? It seems kind of nonsensical, doesn't it? He must must have never read Purpose Driven Church. He must have never read any of our wise scholars that tell us how to plant churches and, and lead people to Jesus. See, you begin with all the all the good things that Jesus can do for you. And then after you've sucked them in, then you tell them about Christ crucified. Maybe if they really want it. But that's not what Paul did, is it? That's not what the church was called to do. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, and this is the reason that he didn't do that. This is the reason that he led with Christ crucified. And this is the reason why we should lead with Christ and Him crucified when we talk to people on the streets. 
But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Christ crucified is salvation to both Jew and the Greek. This is true because the power of God is stronger than man. So many times the world has tried to stop this message from physical attacks that seek to silence the messengers to false teachers seeking to change the message. And all the world can do in their attacks is spread the message further. God's power seems weak to the world, but it is far more powerful. And it is also the wisdom of God. Christ hung on the tree to be the curse for His people. This is the only means that God uses to accomplish His redemptive plan. That is His wisdom. And comparatively, if you would call it foolish, if you would be so foolish as to call God's wisdom foolish, then it is safe to say that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. God, in veiling the wisdom of His plan, has proven His plan to be wiser than any plan that the world could come up with And the meekness of Christ in going to the cross that the world perceived as weakness is stronger than the world. It looks weak and foolish to those who are perishing, but to the church at Corinth, they should see the reality. This salvation, Christ and Him crucified, yes, the cross of Christ and Him crucified is wisdom. It is a symbol of being cursed. Being hung on a tree does mean that you are cursed. And if Jesus truly was hung on that tree, He was hung on that tree to be a curse for His church. Yes, that's good. That's what we believe. And it might look foolish to everybody else, but we know the truth because God has given us that truth and made us to believe it. Paul continues his argument further by bringing the church itself into focus. In point three, God displays His wisdom through the weak. Verses 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brothers. First, Paul reminds the church that they are adopted into the family of God. He is reminding them that they are called into the family of God. They did not choose Christ because it was plausible, because they were smarter than other people, because they just grasped it when everybody else didn't. They believed it because they were called. Already through their experience of being drawn to Christ, the church should know that it's not about personality. It's not about the skill of the preacher. It's not about the, how many degrees he had or, or what school of, that he went to, whether Plato or Socrates, or if he brings any of that into the pulpit. It's about Christ drawing them. The one thing that should be repulsive to the senses of all men everywhere is the one thing that draws them into Christ. Their own calling should remind them of the reality of what is true wisdom. But just in case there are still some in the church at Corinth reading this who want to hold on to worldly wisdom, Paul continues his argument. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Paul is reminding the church that if it takes worldly wisdom, worldly affluence to draw people to Christ, then they're in big trouble. If the gospel needs help from any man or man-made system to be effective, they need to take a look at themselves and realize that they are not the solution. Compared to the rest of the world, according to what the world calls wise and powerful and noble, the church comes up short every single time. This is shown throughout the New Testament. The churches are filled with widows, poor, slaves, sick, maybe the lower middle class. The wealthy often have to sell everything in order to help their brothers and sisters be able to just squeak by in existence. And that's why the the office of deacon is created in the book of Acts because there are so many people in the church that are needy, so many people in the church that are hurting, so many people in the church that are weak, that that can be taken advantage of. So the very existence of, of of our office of deacon is evidence that our churches are not powerful in the eyes of the world. It's not exactly a recruitment strategy for a Fortune 500 company, is it? Christ going to the weakest. But that's exactly what God does. Verse 27, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. 
God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God chose. He called who He called, not so that they would add anything to the power or the wisdom or the might of God, but in spite of their lack of wisdom and power and might, there is not a single person who will be in heaven that has ever added anything to the glory, to the majesty of God. God has taken the weak and frail, the intellectually incapable, into His kingdom. And He does that so that He can use them in His hand to bring the kingdoms of the world to nothing. Paul is not trying to get the church to feel sorry for itself. He is pointing them to the purpose of their salvation. And that purpose is so that Christ is exalted in the salvation of His church. Paul is encouraging the church that who they are in Christ is what Christ will use to accomplish His plan of redemption. The church does not need to adapt the plan or figure out new tactics or change who they are as people. They need to be faithful. And Christ will use that faithfulness to shame the wise, to shame the strong, and to bring to nothing the things that are. Just look at some of the, the churches that are filled with the weak in the book of Acts, for instance. You see cultures turned upside down by this church. You see whole nations throughout the world, throughout church history, changed by this weak group of people. People that are not turn whole world systems on their heads. And God is using that. That's what He's doing. And as Paul continues, this salvation that he's talking about this salvation to these foolish, to these weak people. It covers all of life for the glory of Christ in verse 30. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Because of what seems foolish to the outside world, the church is brought into Christ Jesus. The church is brought into redemptive relationship with God by the work of Christ. And when that happens, what seemed foolish to man now is revealed to be wisdom from God. The church is blessed to see the cross for what it is. Power and wisdom. And what that wisdom is the way to righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Paul is saying that the wisdom of the cross is a holistic salvation that begins, continues, and is finished by Christ. In other words, we are legally declared righteous without guilt for our sins, and we are, raw, and we are robed with the righteousness of Christ. That's what that righteousness is. Sanctification. We are sanctified. We are being transformed into the people of God who love God and want to obey Him. And we have redemption. And Paul is most likely referring to the end of time when we will be released from the effects of sins on our bodies and on this world. So the result of this salvation is that the church now boasts in the Lord. In being saved, there is only room for boasting in Christ. The pride that, come, that some in the church were expressing through factions was antithetical to the cross they claimed to cling to. If, if the people in the church had really understood Paul, if they had really understood Apollos, if they had really understood Peter, and ultimately if they, had, if they had really grasped and understood Jesus, then they would express that through humility and worship, not through factions and infighting. Paul has dismantled the pride of the church in this section by reminding them that they were chosen because they are not special. They are not wise. They are not powerful. And God chose them to highlight His glory but just so the church remembers that Paul is one of them and possibly to, put the, to arrest these factions once and for all, Paul turns in and looks at himself and his ministry with them. Point four, God displays his wisdom in weakness. God displays his wisdom in weak ministers. 
And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Paul came to preach the gospel, and he did it excluding lofty speech. That word for lofty is used in 1 Timothy chapter 2 to describe the high positions of rulers. Paul is pointing out that his speech was not of regal uh, uh, account or accent. He would not be able to bring his gospel before the representatives of the land, the emperor and the kings, and it go over well for him. In fact, we have an instance of this in the book of Acts when he's preaching before Felix, and Felix calls him mad or crazy or insane for what he is preaching. Paul did not come, come to the church at Corinth in pomp, expecting the royal rings of his hands to be kissed because what he was saying was so special. His example was not of a man who could be mistaken for anything sophisticated. His wisdom was not the latest craze from the courts of Rome or the halls of the philosophers. Nothing about his proclamation was grand in appearance. In fact, the contents of his proclamation are very simple. Verse 2, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So he has a two-part ministry among the people. And what we need to remember about Paul is he wasn't among the disciples who walked with Jesus in his earthly ministry. He did not witness the crucifixion firsthand. And he... He was, he, was, he was not there when Jesus ascended with the apostles. Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. As far as Paul was concerned, the Jesus Christ he knew was risen and ruling from heaven. He was preaching this Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father. He preached the Jesus that expounded all of the Old Testament scriptures to the disciples on the road to, to Emmaus. Paul preached all, that means that Paul would have preached all of scripture and how it points to Jesus. And he preached the crucifixion. Jesus rose from something, right? And it was a death brought about by a bloody cross. Paul preached the atoning work of Jesus, pouring out his blood for his people. He preached the sacrifice that brought the people of God into reconciled relationship with God. Paul preached this powerful message. But this message was not detached from his humanity, from who he was. Verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. We know from elsewhere that Paul was a very sickly man. Luke the physician often traveled with him to help him with his, his, his frequent ailments. So it could be that Paul is talking about his, his trembling in this sense. I think it's more likely that he's talking about the fact that he's, he's preaching the risen Savior and he has met the Savior on a road where he was literally knocked off his horse. And so he has a very high level of respect for this Jesus. And so when he comes preaching, he knows that he's not just looking at the people in the, in the pews. He's, he's preaching before the holy, righteous King of King and Lord of Lords. And so he has some trembling in his stature. Paul was also beaten, stoned. We see often that he, would, he literally was stoned to where everybody thought he was dead at one point got back up and went back into town and preached this very same gospel. So Paul came preaching knowing what would happen. He knew that some would believe and repent and he knew that some would try to kill him. And so every time Paul stood up to preach, he knew this reality and he walked in a manner in keeping with it. Verse 4. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. Paul's message makes no sense. I want you to do me a favor, a thought experiment. Name one person, and you can't use the Bible, that's cheating. Name one person who has come back from the dead, who has appeared to people after their resurrection, ascended into heaven, and poured out a spirit for the purpose of conquering the world through messengers speaking about that dying Savior. It's not possible, is it? But that is exactly what Paul did. He preached an impossible, implausible gospel. And it works. The Spirit of God accompanied that message and converted souls. It preserved Paul, bringing him through all those persecutions and bringing people to Christ despite those persecutions. The words may have seemed implausible, but the Spirit of God accompanying them in power and converted souls to Christ. The section ends with the reason why God 
chose this means for salvation. And if this point is lost, the church is lost. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Salvation comes so that God will be the one that the church places their trust in. For the church at Corinth to trust in the abilities of Paul, Apollos, Paul, Peter, or any other man is to miss the point entirely. God used these weak men powerfully so that he would receive men. The faith of the church must rest in the power of God, not in the wisdom of man. Are you ever tempted, brothers and sisters, to trust in the conventional wisdom of the world? Do you ever think that it might be better if instead of having somebody up here preaching Christ and Him crucified, that maybe we could just loop some Oprah or Ben Shapiro or some other political pundit over and over again? Maybe that would draw people in. You, but we know, and I hope you know, you won't find the life-giving word your soul needs in any word except the one that exposes your mind and heart to the Jesus that lived the perfect life as the, as the representative of his people, died a death in their place, received the wrath of the Father for their sins, rose on the third day for their justification, and ascended to the right hand of the Father to rule and to pour out his Holy Spirit on his church. Brothers and sisters, this gospel message is still being used today to bring the world to shame. Men and women in impossible situations are being drawn to Christ every single day. This gospel is still the way that God puts to shame the world in their power, in their wisdom. And this is still the gospel that God is using today to bring to nothing the things that are. Do you see that? Do you believe it? When somebody at work or when somebody that you meet on the street seems to have problems that need to be solved, is the first thought in your mind that they need Christ and Him crucified? It ought to be, because we know that this is the power of God to bring the world to an end, to bring glory to God, and to save His people. The wisdom of God is powerful to save. It may not seem that way to those who are perishing, but that is God's intended plan. Nothing needs to be changed about the plan. But the church needs to be reminded of the reality of the person and work of Jesus Christ and him being the only means of salvation. Do not put your trust in armies or in chariots and do not put your trust in any man. God is the one we trust and God is the one we boast in. Foolish factions are torn apart when we come to Christ. Brothers and sisters, let us come to Christ and let us always be a church that is without faction, and a church that is always praising and boasting in a great Savior. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would help us to always believe this gospel, to always proclaim this gospel, to always serve this Christ, and to always remind each other of the need for this Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with me, take your Trinity hymnal, let us respond to this message by singing hymn 301, join all the glorious names, 301.
Here the blessing of our God, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen.